I'd like to welcome David Swenson to our podcast today, Kieran Yoga Podcast. Very happy to invite him to speak. Um, he started practicing in 1969, introduced by his brother Doug, also a yoga teacher, and he first went to Mysore in 1977. There are a few people that have been initiated into all the Ashtanga series uh, and Pranayamas. And subsequently to that, he has traveled the world um, for many years, and many of you know him already, presenting in a very accessible and down-to-earth way Ashtanga Yoga to probably millions of people by now. Um, and a producer of many guides and Ashtanga videos, um, short forms, and the seminal practice manual, which is my first teaching compendium. Uh, we met David and his lovely wife, uh, I think it was 2007 at Purple Valley, uh, when he was teaching, and then uh, on Sharat's workshop. So without further ado, over to you, David. Welcome to the Keyhole Yoga Podcast. Great to be here. Thank you. Adam. Great to have you. Mm-hmm. So um, the obvious starting question is, how did you get into yoga in the first place? Yes. Well, I grew up in Texas. And as you know, everyone in Texas does yoga. So it was a natural thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. Especially at the time when I was beginning yoga in 1969, I was just lucky that my older brother, he's five years older, <clears throat> he became interested in health. He was a surfer. And yes, you can surf in Texas. There's a coast there. And he would go to California. And through his travels and surfing, he came across yoga and some books <clears throat> and came back home to Texas and was doing this stuff and eating healthy foods. And I was just lucky that I had a big brother that was had a healthy lifestyle. And so I, mm. I joined in. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. You got to tell the story in the park where, <laughs> I mean, I, I, do that. I, yeah, I know some of these already. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I'm happy to tell the story again. So yeah. At this time, yoga was odd, especially in Texas. Um, and so there were no yoga studios. And as I tell these stories, I'm a little like our grandparents telling stories like, way back when I learned yoga, we didn't have them fancy sticky things to practice on. We practiced on broken glass. Yes, we did. <laughs> it's a little like that. That's not yeah, quite yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. It was odd. There were no yoga studios, no yoga teachers, no yoga clothes. If we're lucky, we could find a yoga book. So we did actually book. have mats, did you? There were no mats. No, there was no such no, thing. No, no. Mm-hmm. We yeah, practiced exactly. on bed sheets, a bed sheet or a beach towel. Yeah. And I've got some old videos of me doing that, practicing on a bed sheet in the grass. And the first book we ever had, I'd be surprised if you or your listeners has, have heard of it. It was called Yoga, Youth, and Reincarnation by Jess Stern. And it had a few postures that we had that book and we would scour bookstores or see what we could find. There was no such thing as online. There was no web. Mm -hmm. then. So um, you look in old bookstores and things and we found Swami Satchidananda's Integral Yoga, BKS Iyengar's Light on Yoga. We would take these books and go to the park under a tree, open the book and just read it and do the yoga. Yeah. So, I was growing my hair long. It was, you know, part of the thing. And my brother and I were under a tree doing yoga in the park. Police cars came into the park. They pulled their guns out. Oh, I, did. I remember that part of it. <laughs> yeah. What are you boys doing here? <laughs> we're breathing and stretching, officer. They say, well, the neighbors called, said you're doing some kind of devil worship out here. Because we were scantily clad under yeah, trees, yeah. you know, doing yeah. this sort of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like thing. In their mind, we were devil worshipers, long-haired, half-naked hippies, you know, in the park. <clears throat> so they decided that we really weren't worth their time and they let us alone. <laughs> That was the environment. It was not supportive. Mm, a lot mm. of people weren't doing yoga. It was hippies. Everywhere in the world, the people outside of India that were doing yoga were hippies because they were interested in something different than their parents had. Mm. 
like in the 50s in America, I'm not sure in the UK and Europe, but it was a, a more conservative and it was, everything was sort of like, yeah. prearranged or something and all of a sudden there was the vietnam war and and the the hippies were revolting against this perceived idea of how you had to live your life and they were experimenting with drugs and going to india and looking for different philosophies and so yoga was part of that whole counterculture that was growing in well people actually anti-yoga i mean now it's like if you don't do yoga you're kind of counterculture <laughs> But um, at that, that time, were people quite kind of, I mean, like you say to your parents, I mean, what do they think about you doing yoga and going off to India, et cetera? And now it's a kind of veritable career move. Well, you know, it's like, well. <laughs> yeah. Our yeah, right? parents were amazing. I'm just right. lucky. I had, we had, myself mm. and my two siblings, had wonderful parents. Yeah, they were open-minded, mm. liberal. My father was a criminal defense attorney. So he represented people drug dealers and thieves and things. And his kids just wanted to grow their hair long, not eat meat and stretch their bodies. So he was like, ah, it could be worse. You know, so they were open, <laughs> open to it. And they mm -hmm. raised us to be free thinking and to follow our heart. And he didn't push us to have a particular um, career. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to be happy. And I think part of that came from his upbringing. But his, my grandparents, his parents mm. were very strict, stern Swedes. They came over on a boat from right. Sweden. And their life was hard. And, mm. and they came across on a boat and they worked hard and they had the mindset of life isn't frivolous. You know, you don't mm. goof around and you don't have mm. fun and you don't play around. You don't laugh. You work hard. You save every penny. You put your head down. And mm. so... Our parents could have raised us like that, but he almost went the other way of like, life is too short. Right. Support yourself, but feel free, you know? And so I was lucky to have that. But outside of that, it was very weird. Mm. And it wasn't just yoga. They didn't even know what yoga was. It was just, if you were a little too different, then there was a lot of reason to dislike you. <laughs> I always remember the other story about the wigs in school that you had to you had yeah. to wear like a, a, a short hair wig for the guy that yes. you had longer hair, right? I'll mention that, but also I just want to put something else in perspective because this is also yeah. poignant with what's going on right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the time in America that I was growing up, there were separate water fountains for whites and coloreds. Really? There were separate toilets, men, women, and colored. Really? There was incredible racism, huh. blatant and, and horrible racism. Um, and what's happened over the years, the racism is still there, but it sort of was right. glossed over with things. And that's now mm. you see Black Lives Matter and, and this other stuff mm. coming up because it's the racism remained beneath the surface sometimes blatant but things progressed but not in the way that they could have or should have so now mm. there's a movement and a push to try to bring awareness to that but this was a, particularly in the area i grew up it was a very narrow-minded idea of mm. life so anything that was a little out of the ordinary even the color of your skin the way that you look right. much mm. less yoga mm. and things like that mm. Mm. So when I went into high school, I'm growing my hair long, and it was illegal to have long hair. They actually had drawings of of Where? acceptable at the school or, or in Texas generally. In, in Texas, I don't know about other states, but in the state of Texas, yeah, it was not a private institution. This was a public high school. Okay, where yeah, honestly, the principal of every grade level was an ex-football coach, American football yeah, coach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing against football coaches, but at that time, they had no educational background. And they, they would just um, one day be like, well, I can't really play football anymore, so I guess I'll just run the school. So right. they were enforcers of rules. 
And some of those rules, one of which was a boy's hair could not touch the collar of their shirt. Their sideburn could not be below the bottom of their ear and the hair could not touch their ear. Girls had to kneel down and their skirt had to touch the ground when they would kneel. Because this was the time people were wearing mini skirts and stuff yeah. like that, right? And again, this was not some posh institution. This was just your average school. So I didn't want to cut my hair. One day a principal comes up to me and they talk like this, boy, you know what time it is, boy? Well, it's time for a haircut. <laughs> and he laughs. And I say, well, I don't want to cut my hair. And these guys, you don't say no to them. And many of them, even though they were principal, you still called them coach. You would coach, you know. And you don't say no. They were just, I said, I don't want to cut my hair. What do you mean, boy? I told you cut your hair. I don't want to cut my hair. You cut your hair, boy. I'm not cutting my hair. And they don't know what to do. They're going to kick me out of school. Now, my father, being this criminal defense attorney and a defender of, of you know, justice and so forth, causes this whole situation that, well, they cause it, but it's the whole independent school district in Houston, in the city where we're living, which ultimately affected all the laws in Texas and maybe the rest of the country. <laughs> they called a big school board meeting. And it took place in a gymnasium. Up on the stage was a big table. And up there, it was all guys. You know the term redneck, like these mm. narrow-minded guys mm. up, sitting up there and with their arms crossed and a gymnasium full of students and their parents and teachers. And in the middle of the floor was the microphone sat there. And it was like a public forum. You could come up and mm. say what you need to do. So my father approaches his microphone and, and addresses these men up there. And he says this, my good gentleman, to my knowledge, Jesus had long hair. Moses had long hair. Albert Einstein had long hair and the founding fathers of this great country, the United States of America, they all had long hair. My sons, therefore, are in very fine company, and I'm not going to force them to cut their hair, so I simply ask of you, what is the alternative? They freak out. They don't even know how to answer. They get uncomfortable. They leave. They go back, and there's like closed-door meetings and stuff. They come back with an alternative, which is if we don't want to cut our hair, we have to wear a short-haired wig. For That's three right years, on. I wore a short-haired wig to school. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, I was a bit of a rebel. And so they weren't specific. They said, if you don't cut your hair and you have long hair, you have to wear a wig. But they didn't say I had to put my hair under it. Right. <laughs> So I would take the wig and wear it inside out, like put the cloth side up and a ring of hair and shove it on my head with my hair hanging out the back. It looked horrible. It was like a hair hat, you know, and um, it was hideous. I'd have teachers tell me to take the thing off. I did that for three years. And it must be hot my as well. Junior, oh, it was incredibly hot. I mean, it's yeah. in Texas. And then in, in my junior year of school, I actually left and went to California finished my last year of school right. out there. But that's when mm -hmm. I found out about yoga and mm. other stuff. Found out about how Ashtanga. You, how, okay, how did you find out about Ashtanga and how did you finally get to my school in you know, such early years? Well, when I was 16 years old, after wearing the wig for the third year, I went to California and decided I'm finishing school. I basically left home. I wrote my parents a letter and told them I loved them, but I couldn't take it anymore with these silly, you know, narrow-minded people in this environment, I'm mm. leaving. Mm. And they were upset by this, but they were so incredible that they said, we have raised our children to be independent-minded, so we're not going to force you to come home, but you must agree to these terms. If you're going to move out from home, you have to support yourself. We're not going to send you money. And you need to finish school. You have one year of, of school left. Because by law, they could have brought me home. I was under right. 18. Mm -hmm. But 
I agreed to these terms. I've been working since I was a kid anyway. So I got a job in this like really greasy little 24 hour restaurant place. And I enrolled in school out there. Not only were people not wearing wigs, everyone had long hair. They're all surfers. And I had surfing class in the morning. And I was like, wow, school is great. It was fun. My brother had a friend named Paul Dunaway. <clears throat> He's actually in my book. If you've ever seen him, if you've ever seen my book, and one of the first pages when we're sat in a little circle, a pranayama circle, yeah, he's yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. guys sat there. Oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know the picture. Yeah. <clears throat> so Paul said, wow, David, come check out this yoga. So was, he was doing yoga too. So he brought me to this, this class. And I walk in and it was cold in the room, but I hear this sound of breath like I'd never heard before. It's like the walls were breathing and people moving and flowing and sweat dripping from their body and actually saw steam rising from their bodies because the room wasn't heated. It blew my mind. And this guy walking around there and a, a, a couple, I, mm. I could obviously tell they were the teachers. One of them walks up to me and says, hi, who are you? It's David Williams. Hi, who are you? David. Oh, hi, David. I'm David. I meet David Williams, and Nancy Gogoff. <clears throat> I'm 16 years old, 1973. <clears throat> and that was my first Ashtanga class. And all I got was Surya Namaskara A three times, Surya Namaskara B three times, and the final three postures are closing, finish. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> That's it. That was incredible. Right. Okay. And that was, that was in California. And then, then what happened? You, how long did you practice there? And, and then, then they, well, no, you didn't go to India first of all. Did you stay there? So and, what happened? And, <laughs> I stayed there. I finished yeah. school to the satisfaction of my parents. <clears throat> yeah. I finished high school. My brother and I went on some other adventures. In 1975, David Williams and Nancy Gilgoff brought Patabi Joyce to the U.S. for his first trip. <clears throat> so I was there to study with him. Right. He stayed four months. We did all this intensive practice. He went back to India. I ended up doing various things. David Williams moved to Maui, Hawaii. He invited me to come over to teach his classes while he and Nancy went back to Mysore. So I went to Maui in 1976, 77, and was teaching his classes for him. When they came back from Mysore, I went. So I made my first trip to Mysore, 1977, after David and Nancy um, came back. And by that moment, before I got to India, I had mm. learned through Advanced A, which today would be called Third and Fourth Series. Mm. Before you even got to, to Mysore. Yeah, because I'd been right. practicing for, whatever, four years, and it was an accelerated... Yeah. Program and he was back 16, then. for God's sake. Yeah, you know, I was 16. Young. That's very right. young. <laughs> 16, 17, yeah, 18. Right. You know, I didn't have strength, but I had enthusiasm and some right. flexibility. So, I mean, nowadays, you went for the advanced day practice to my sort, you, you'd be back on primary series pretty, pretty fast. But, but that wasn't the case with you when you first arrived. What's that? Well, you were allowed to do. When you met Patabi Joyce in oh. Mysore, you were, you know, you were straight on to more practice, not less practice, as we would have. That's right. Because, but I had already, he'd known me from America. Right. Remember, he had been there. And when he came in 1975, I was already doing through all of second with him and the first part of third and then, um, or first part of advanced day. And then when he went back to India, David was taking me through more of the next postures. And Patabi Joyce had told David teach. So he was just, showing me whatever he knew. And so by the time I got there, I had learned through that much. And he would just watch and make sure you knew what you were doing. And then he'd give you more. And not only did he not slow you down, he'd give five or six or seven postures a day. It wasn't like one every three months. It was full on accelerated. But put it in perspective. It was me and two other people there. Right. We were young. Patabi yeah, Joyce yeah. Was, he was only 60 years old. I'm 63 now. I'm thinking, wow, Patabi right. Joyce was 60, right? Yeah. And we were just these young, like, Labrador dog yoga enthusiasts. We were just like, yeah. And he decided that we had so much energy. And, and prior to this moment, when David first went there, 
David and Norman Allen also, the locals weren't that enthusiastic about yoga. So mm. they weren't really interested in progressing. We came yeah. in and just said that. And so he was like, mm. okay. He had us practice twice daily in Mysore. We come in at 4.30 in the morning and do practice and then come back again at 4.30 in the afternoon and practice a second time. And then well, he decided, the really, maybe that's not enough. So we had to do two complete series in each practice. All of first and second in the morning, come back in the afternoon. You would either repeat first and then go into advanced day, or you just do two full practices twice daily. But was everyone very good then? Or, or were, was it just the case that um, you, know, you would just practice twice regardless? Or, or was it the standard very high that you could kind of do that much? He just... Oh, he just made to do it. Do it. <laughs> just we had nothing doing. else to do there. I mean, think about yeah, right. it. Mysore, yeah. there was no like internet cafe or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And all you could do is get up in the morning, do your practice, eat some breakfast and collapse. Go back, wake up, do your practice again, eat something, lie down. And I just did that mm. for months. And mm. so he pushed us through advanced B all the way How through. How long did you stay there first? Four months. Four months. And then right, but imagine he adjusted thing. us in every posture. What I'm has wrong. changed, in in my opinion? Like people said, well, David, don't you think that would just feed your ego by getting so many asanas? And I said, well, what do you think feeds someone's ego more? If somebody wants to do advanced series, you say, here's the list, go for it. Or mm -hmm. we wait six months and I bring your new asana on a silver platter. Right. And I say, I <laughs> presenteth to thee. Yeah. Thy new asana. And it's this whole celebration. There's so much importance around that asana. Yeah, yeah. And it, it wasn't a big deal. You want the, the, the sequences were taped on the wall, and it was a four-year program. Year one, primary. Year two, intermediate. Year three, advanced A. Year four, advanced B. Different pranayamas, different books. It was like, get through this practice. Yeah. You know? But it was because of how many people were there. Now, if you mm. went to my store, there'd be more than three people there. <laughs> right? Yes, I, I think you can safely guarantee that. And so what happens is the teachers don't have time to spend with the students yeah. like they did in the early days. Mm. So mm. even if you can fit whatever, 80 people in the room, but there's another 300 waiting to come in, one person finishes, you got to fill that mat, another. And so what happens is, People start getting stopped because you can't bind your hands in Murchiasana D, stop. And so but just that wasn't like the case, we, first of all. It wasn't the case before, no. Right. And standing up and back think about and it. binding. And but Marichyasana is not mm -hmm. called Badahasta Marichyasana. It's not called the bind your hands posture. And then I've had people say, Well, David, you know, you have to stop people or they get injured if you let them carry on and go. But I believe the opposite to be true. Right. I'm not saying this to be just a rebel or something, but just logically and from seeing what's happening. In the mindset of a student, if you're told you cannot go to the next asana after Murchasana D until you can put your foot in half lotus and yeah. bind your hands. Mm -hmm. The student is like, I don't want to be stopped here. They're mm -hmm. cranking their body yeah. so far, they get hurt. Or That's teachers yeah. looking, and all they're thinking is Murchiasana D means bind your hands. Mm. And so they're cranking people with the only view of getting those hands mm. to touch. The knee and the low back are the weakest link. So people are getting all kinds of injuries because mm. they're being stopped. Mm. Rather than presenting an alternative to let them approach the practice, and, and I would say what I, I focus on is integrity of practice. Mm. Breath. Focus and presence, not flexibility. What about vinyasa on that? The, 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 uh, how specific are you to the breath count? So some teachers are very specific. This number of posture and vinyasa. But listen, it's even that's changed over the time. Right, right. But but I would rather someone get into the posture and use a variation. Say they're not doing half lotus for D. They put their foot on the floor, other leg up. And breathe. Breathe five times. That's better than somebody that can get in the posture and their breath is gone. Mm -hmm. People are talking about the vinyasa, but what about the breath? People are like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And the vinyasa flow, even the counting was not there in the early days. 
really. Why is it called Mysore style practice? There were no lead classes in Mysore. There was no such thing as a lead class. He never did a lead class. It's when he started coming to America, he was doing lead classes. My sort of class meant, you know, you sometimes when you're learning a posture, you take a few extra breaths to get there. So you never specified stop. number of vinyasa. Because I think there's a story that, you know, the Tavi Joy used to get questioned by Krishnamacharya, how many vinyasa for, you know, blah, blah, posture. That's not, you, you didn't experience that, that he made you learn the vinyasa with the new well, posture. Well, then, like he, then he would start doing the counting when he came to America, but it's changed it's over there. the years. Right. Yes, but absolutely. even the, what is the traditional counting? I know Sharat ran a teacher training, and I like Sharat too. I mean, I go to his classes. I see him. When he comes to America, I go to him. We're friendly. We go to breakfast after class, whatever. In the world of Ashtanga, I'm Switzerland. I'm just the neutral entity. I don't get involved in all this stuff. But in his teacher training, I wasn't there. My, my wife was there, and I know other people that were. Someone asked him about the Sanskrit counting. They said, Sharat, should we do the Sanskrit counting like it is in Yoga Mala, like it is on your CD, like it is on your DVD, or like you're doing it now? Four different things, right? Right. So what does it mean when you say the, the, the counting, right? Patabi Joyce mm. counted things. Sometimes a little different. And back in the day when Patabi Joyce was alive, if you went to class one day with him, the next day with his son, Manju, the next day with his daughter, Saraswati, the next day mm. with his son, grandson, Sharat, and then with Sharmila, his granddaughter, you just had five different experiences. Yeah, it wasn't like they were all carbon copies of each other. So it's yeah. not strange that each of us teach a little differently, but beneath the surface of all of this, the flow of Ashtanga is the same with tiny little differences. Mm. But rather than just focus on a number, I focus on the breath. Right. <clears throat> rather than it just has to be a number. Even read Yoga Mala. How many breaths do you hold a posture? Yeah. There's no number. Mm-hmm. They'll say hold as long as you can. Later, mm-hmm. things became more codified like this, where it's a very specific thing. And I believe it's because of the number of people. Yeah. yeah. And it's you not bad. I think the Sanskrit Sorry. counting is beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful to witness. But it's for people that already know the practice. It's like you're a dancer or you're a, a musician, and the symphony conductor is just going like this. But you already know the song. It's not, it's not instructional. Mm. And that's why, you know, then they started doing it once a week. But the Mysore style is where you're learning. <clears throat> I think it's funny, isn't it? Because people often think the Mysore style is something to graduate to. And then lead class is where you learn. But actually, it's the Mysore style, which, you know, can take from a beginner, you know. And then the lead class is actually the hardest thing, right? Um, right. What about, what about the kind of moon days and the days off and this kind of protocol? You know, I mean, just that, how is that with you? How, how did you experience that? Well, Patabi Joyce always did observe those things, the moon days, right. <clears throat> ladies' holiday, and Saturday. It was always right. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yoga students, Western students would try to figure out, why is it Saturday? You know, and they'd go, oh, astrologically, Saturday, that's Saturn Day. Saturn Day is a less auspicious day. That's why it's the day off. And and then we would joke and we'd say, no, 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 Patabi Joyce's favorite television show was Saturday mornings, you know. <clears throat> but the story goes actually that his wife made him take a day off because he didn't want to take yeah. a day off. And Ama said, man, you got to take a day off, spend some time with your family. <laughs> Killing him. <laughs> so it became Saturday. <clears throat> yeah. The moon days were because he was a Vedic astrologer. According to astrological beliefs, the moon days are more erratic energy. Right. And the belief was that it's a greater likelihood to become injured on a moon day. And if you become injured, it takes longer to heal. <clears throat> Whether you want to accept those things or not, we are affected by moons. Emergency rooms are busier. Farmers would traditionally plant by moon cycles and so forth. Mm. But we did observe those moon days. <clears throat> mm. And he would look at his calendar certain days he would not give you a a new asana because it wasn't auspicious he wouldn't travel on those days you don't cut your Mm. hair on certain days etc um and then there's ladies holiday 
no practice during menstrual cycle. So those were the the standard days off. Uh, recently, in the last few years, Shrat changed the day off in my sort of Sunday. Mm. Yeah, and and so I saw him on tour shortly after that, and like I said, we're friendly. I said, "Hey, Shrat, I heard you changed the day off to Sunday." He said, "Oh yeah." He said, "You know, my kids always had school programs on Saturday." So I never had a day off. So I switched it to Sunday so I could have a, a true day off. I said, wow, that makes perfect sense. Mm-mm. But what happened is his, some of his students started treating it as though Patanjali appeared to him in a dream and told him it has to be Sunday off. Because even in one of his conferences, someone said, Sharat, you changed it to Sunday. We've always had Saturday. Should we change it to Sunday? And he said, you do what you like. I did mm-hmm. it because of my family. You take the day off you want. Mm. But then some students went away from there going like, you're disrespecting the lineage if you don't change your day off to Sunday. Right. But really, right. it's just take a day off. So okay. what do you think about moon days? Do you, do you take moon days or have you got any experience of, of I just that say that working or not? If it's a moon day right. and you want to practice, just be more aware. It's right. okay. Just practice, mm-hmm. just be more aware. Honestly, I think it's also just built in there so that people don't overpractice. Right. In Ashtanga yoga, the strictest approach of Ashtanga works out to about five days a week. Mm. It's about, it's not six days. If you take away the Saturday or the Sunday, either one of those days. Right, I see, and the moon days. Now, yeah, yeah. now take yeah. away the moon days, generally yeah, they're yeah, not on yeah. a weekend. Right. So now you're down to five and a half days average. You've been to Mysore many times. How many holidays are there? You go to the shala and say, oh, today shala closed. No practice. Why? Today, cow day. Very special day, shala closed. Mm. So it works out like five days a week. And ladies' holiday is going to be less than that. I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, obviously you were kind of like one of a couple of people originally with Vitavi Joyce. He was like, uh, well, a kind of young-ish man still. Um, uh, People used to advise me when I first went to Mysore, Oh, you know, watch out for the injuries. Was, was your experience the very, very strong adjustments, and did you get injured? I'd like, I'd, I've never heard you speak about that. Well, Patabi Joyce had heavy-handed adjustments. Yeah, you know? mm. he gave big adjustments, but you have to put this in perspective because he was much softer than his teacher. Mm. Krishnamacharya was brutal. He was known as Simha Guru. Right. He would hit and kick and slap his students, yeah? And Patabi Joyce told a story that he, when he was young and had first met Krishnamacharya, they were traveling around India to promote yoga. And they would go out into a field, and Krishnamacharya was a, a scholar, Sanskrit scholar. He would debate and give philosophical discourse and things. So Patabi Joyce is there. He tells him, Kapotasana. But Tabi Joyce on the, on the dirt goes into Kapotasana. Krishnamacharya then stands on Patabi Joyce's belly while he's in, Krishna, while he's in Kapotasana mm. and gives a, a discourse for 30 minutes. There's a stick sticking up out of the ground. It's a sharp stick in Patabi Joyce's shoulder. And it's just going deeper and deeper like a knife into his shoulder for 30 minutes. And he would tell this story. He said, oh, coming up. Some hole is coming. Some bloods are coming. Dirts I'm taking, I'm putting. He had a bloody hole in his shoulder and he just rubbed dirt in it. After his teacher stood on his back and shoved the stick in his shoulder. He showed us the scar. Imagine 40 years later, somebody says, Guruji, my knees hurt. He's like, whatever. (laughs) I don't see any bones hanging out of your body. And I thought, oh, maybe he's exaggerating. I heard BKS Iyengar give a story, telling a a story about how mean his teacher was. He said he would hit them and kick them and slap them and yell at them, wake them up in the middle of the night and bah, bah. It's like, wow. Then I heard Krishnamacharya's own son, Deskachar, give a talk. And he said he didn't want to do a yoga yoga when he was a young boy so he would run and hide from his father and one day he climbed up in a mango tree in the yard well his father knew he was there and he waited until he came down from the tree he had him go to Bhadapadmasana. 
he tied his hands to his feet with rope and left him for four hours in the yard. Wow. So Deskachar <laughs> says, I didn't really want to do yoga after that. And you check it out. Deskachar yeah. didn't really practice yoga until much right. later in his life. Right. right? Mm. So Patabi Joyce gave big adjustments, but he was much softer than, than his teacher. And I didn't get a, injuries, yeah? But I also learned how to push back. Early on, I right. decided that if something didn't feel right, I'd just push back against it rather than totally okay. sink in. Right, right. Yeah. Hmm. And so, yeah, I didn't get injured, but right. um, that's not to say other people didn't. I mean, there were some yeah, big, yeah. big adjustments that he made. But it doesn't have to be that. And it's, it's why I started teacher training courses years ago. Because I got injured from some teachers pushing me. And I was like, wow, adjustments should, should not be thrown away. Yeah? Because people say, well, adjustments are bad. Somebody gets hurt. And I go, but it's like going and getting a massage and somebody gets hurt from a massage. Mm. Or the chiropractor that hurts your neck. It doesn't mean chiropractic is bad. It means you had a bad experience. If you teach how people how to do it correctly, it's a positive experience. It's like Thai massage. You're mm. going and you're stretching people out. It's a, a cooperative effort. And so I'm a fan of making adjustments. You just have to know how to do it. Of course, now Can you, you can't with our situation. Well, yeah. <laughs> Can you say anything more about how you give adjustments then? Are you, are you, you're, you're adjusting someone into a posture or are you guiding them to show the body how to do it? I mean, but what's well, the right adjustment these, as opposed to a wrong one? I've been running these 40-hour trainings on how to, mm. how to teach, yeah? And mm, mm. we start the first day with something I call the zero to 10 rule, which you, don't, you start with, with no contact and 10 the maximum amount, and you slowly start to adjust and you get feedback and decide, what percentage of pressure you're going to apply. You're getting mm. feedback by looking at the student's facial expressions, their body. You're listening mm. to their breath if you feel the breath restrict. Or you're also giving students permission to say, no, I don't want an adjustment. Right. And so from early on, I say, you empower the student. Let them know they can speak up. It's not like total surrender. It's like, I'm coming up to adjust you. First of all, if you don't want an adjustment, you look and say, I don't want an adjustment. Or if I'm adjusting you, something feels like it's too much, you tell me. Mm. But over time, like I went to massage school, yeah? How do you know how hard to push someone? It takes mm. skill. It takes practice. Mm. So there's that. You look, you learn, you listen, you communicate. And then where do you touch? Where do you never touch, right? So these are the things I would go through in my teacher training. I've been doing that for 30 years. Mm. I, I would call it the high voltage areas of the body. Don't touch those areas, et cetera. Mm. So proper adjustments enhance the experience of the student. They should feel great. Yeah. Right. But incorrect mm. adjustment doesn't mean adjustments are bad. It means you got a bad adjustment. And everything you say, there's so many questions that come to mind. I know we've got so, kind of so little time to talk about this stuff, but how, what, would you, um, what would you look for in a good teacher then? Because sometimes it's like, well, you, you don't know until you know, and then it's kind of too late sometimes. You don't know what a good adjustment should feel like maybe, or, you know? I mean, how in do you my teach teacher training courses, I would have a whole list of what are the qualities of a good teacher. Mm, mm, right. So, and you would say compassion. That means someone that has an interest in the well-being of others. Mm -hmm. A good teacher is patient. You know how teachers all the time will tell students to be patient? But teachers have to be patient. Right. You have to understand a student needs time. Just because you say to do something, you've got to be patient. And, and they learn to observe the situation rather than a preconceived idea. You don't make assumptions by initial um, viewing of someone. For instance, we, make, we size someone up. Do not make assumptions that someone cannot do something until you see they cannot do it. Other than that, just present the yoga. Because some people think, should I present all of these like pre-postures before the final pose? I go, just present the yoga. Don't hmm. assume by someone's size of their body or their age or whatever, present the yoga. And then modify as required. A good teacher will communicate with the student. Yeah? A good teacher will take responsibility for their actions. 
a good teacher is honest. But honesty means saying when we don't know the answer to something. Honesty means just be yourself. I can imitate other people and be inspired by other people, but I can't be another person. Mm-hmm. You have to find your voice. You have to learn yeah. to teach from your own mm. experience and mm. don't lie. A lie is mm. the problem is not people teaching too soon. The problem is people trying to teach more than they know. Right. Mm. But knowing something doesn't just mean the ability to do it. Someone might be a great football player and not a good coach. Someone might be a great gymnast, but they don't know how to coach gymnastics. Somebody yeah. can be a great practitioner of yoga and be a terrible teacher. Yeah, I so feel often it goes that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the skills yeah. of teaching don't necessarily align with the ability to do. However, students that had a really difficult time developing their practice tend to be a more compassionate teacher than someone mm. who could just readily do it because they understood this process and this journey they had to go through. Good teachers respect the student. Good teachers communicate. Good students, good teachers create thinking students. And the best teachers create students that don't need them anymore. Right. Have your style of teaching changed over the years? Or have you always taught from the same principles? Or have you mended your style of presenting? Or yeah, yeah. I think I've always taught from the same principles. But you know, <laughs> yeah. how we remember yeah. things doesn't necessarily yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. translate, but it seems like I've taught pretty much from this same idea because you never were hard because of my journey and, and like other that. things I've done. Yeah, you know? yeah. Mm-hmm. And observing and seeing the pitfalls of, of power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I went, I became a Hare Krishna, I did all these other things, you know, and by seeing the pitfalls of guruism and being way up there, I go, no, no, no. We need to understand that as a teacher, we are the servant of the student. We're not the master. The guru is the practice. The teacher is there to to encourage, to inspire, and to facilitate the practice. Mm -hmm. The guru is not a person. The teacher is there to facilitate that and to introduce the student to the practice. And the learning comes through the practice, in my opinion. There's too many pitfalls. You're putting too much pressure on this person up there. Yeah? What do you reckon about tradition then? Do you have anything? I mean, I kind of, well, I I suppose we get the tenure of what you feel about it. But I mean, Ashtanga Yoga is becoming, I suppose, increasingly kind of rigid and linear in its presentation. I mean, you know, I suppose you spoke a little bit about that, but what's the benefit of tradition? Perhaps let's reframe the question. Define tradition. Right. What is lineage? What is parampara? You hear this a lot. The Mm. tradition, the lineage. What is the lineage? Is it a bloodline? If it's a bloodline, why didn't Patabi Joyce send all of us to Krishnamacharya? Tommy Joyce didn't invent this. He learned it from his teacher. His teacher was mm. alive when we were going there. He didn't send us to Krishnamacharya. That's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think that. If it's a bloodline, why isn't Sharat sending everyone to Krishnamacharya's offspring? Right? If it was a lineage of blood, Sharat should send everyone to Krishnamacharya's kids. Right? Yeah. When did it become a bloodline? So parampara, lineage, means teacher-student, 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 teacher-student Yeah. in this line. But it also, there, teachers don't necessarily have one student. It could be teacher with these students, right? And then from those students, they've got some students. So it goes like that, yeah? And as I mentioned earlier, Patabi Joyce taught different than his son, than his daughter. Sharat teaches different than his uncle, teaches different than his sister, teaches different than his own teacher, Patabi Joyce. Mm. So when you say tradition, it's respecting the big picture, but understanding there's going to be little differences. 
And rather than fight over the differences, it's okay. Shelly and I have been doing what we call MOM, Mysore on Maui, or month of Mysore. So people would come to Hawaii for a month. We were supposed to be there this August, but with the whole COVID thing, we've had to postpone that to next year. But So people would come from all over. And honestly, I've been teaching every series of Ashtanga original advanced A, advanced B, and people that are totally new to Ashtanga come to, were, come to this event. And what's interesting also is I can tell what teacher a student's been practicing with. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, there's Nancy Gogoff's student. That's David Williams' students. <clears throat> That's Sharat's student. That's Manju's student. I don't try to change what they're doing. I just facilitate their practice. Right. If they learned it that way, it's okay. It's, it, in my mind, it's still part of the lineage. Nancy Gilgoff has been doing this for 50 years or something, right? <clears throat> How she learned it. Okay, that's her student. Yeah, they're in my class, but I'm only there with them for a month. I'm not going to change everything they're doing unless something's way different. But I know these other teachers. And so I just respect the way that they're being taught and just facilitate their practice. So I suppose it's a very general question, but what's the aim of yoga in your mind, having done it for since, uh, oh, 40, it's an 50 easy years? Answer. The right. answer is actually simple. It's a tool. Okay. The goal of yoga is to increase prana in the body. And what is the purpose of that? Is it totally for selfish reasons? In some ways, we have to be cautious as yoga practitioners that we don't just become these in incredibly self-obsessed people it's all about me 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 i i i what do i want blah 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 Mm -hmm. when you put the letters i s h at the end of a word it means pertaining to so selfish is a good thing actually pertaining to the self all right so something that is a selfish pursuit is okay but there's a tipping point where it becomes a negative thing And that's when it is to the exclusion of everything else. If my only motivation is for self-aggrandizement and for personal benefit and glory, we've missed it. So the purpose of yoga, in my opinion, is to increase prana in the body, then take that positive life force and go out and make the world a better place. Going to Mysore is a great thing. Go there and recharge. A lot of teachers, you know, they're teaching, they're giving so much energy. It's great. Occasionally or once a year, whatever, you go there, you get some energy of your own. You recharge your batteries. But the goal isn't just to hang in Mysore and and wait for your next posture. The goal is to get there, recharge, go back to the community where you live and become a productive citizen. Apply the yoga in real life situations. Otherwise, we're we're just a bunch of self-centered, you know, egocentric people. Mm. We've got to take this and the yoga should make us more humble. Yeah. The yoga shouldn't turn us into these egomaniacs. The yoga should be something that, wow, we're we should gain empathy and sympathy and understanding and find ways to to share love. Yeah, and, and why do you think he often days. isn't doing that? What's going what's that? wrong? That it, what, what's going wrong that so many people have become obsessed with asana um, and to even to have missed the kind of because more philosophical because yoga is just a tool. Yeah, and sometimes you have to go to the extreme. So I say it like this: the practice of yoga, whether it's asanas or let's say you're a meditator or you like to chant on beads, or chant in bhajan, or do meditation, whatever it is. All of those practices, all the practice itself does, the sadhana, all it does is creates fertile ground, like a gardener. A gardener turns, tills the soil, and then puts organic compost and nutrients and makes this fertile, beautiful environment. That's what practice does. It creates fertility. Our maturity of understanding will be determined by the seeds we choose to plant in that fertile earth. What will happen if someone does a ton of practice and throws a few ego seeds in the ground? 
they grow a bigger ego than the average person because mm. the fertile ground is there. We must become more and more aware with the more practice we do as to what are the mm. seeds we're planting in the ground. And this is svadhyaya. This is self-study. This is not easy. But you've got to look at the garden and pull the weeds and figure out what am I growing in there? Mm. Yeah. And so it's not strange that this thing occurs. It's just yoga, people doing yoga, and they get benefit, and it takes some time to figure it out. I'm not saying everybody does that, but there's a tendency, or, or, or you could even just say, just because someone can do amazing asanas doesn't even mean they're a nice person. Yeah, sure. Right? I mean, I, people can do all kinds of series and be selfish. And I guess we could ask ourselves, wow, what would they be like if they didn't do yoga? <laughs> Or does the yoga in some ways amplify who we already are? It starts to <laughs> I mean, I, expand it. I suppose I don't want to go too much into the Batavi Joyce kind of, you know, uh, subject, but I mean, you had a relationship with him and you had some, you know, an empathy with him and a respect for him. And or many people have been disappointed in recent years due to the allegations and feeling that the practice is somehow, the, the shame of it for me is that somehow the practice is affiliated with the man. Um, can, you, can you say anything about that? I'm sure you've been asked many times before. Albert Einstein was not a perfect man. He had affairs. Mm. But does it mean the theory of relativity is not true? Right. But Tommy Joyce was not a perfect man. <clears throat> and you're talking about People being a Jew, a, a, a adjusted in such a way that they felt even like they were abused or something, right? Particularly women have come out and said that. The worst thing you can do is to say that they did not have the experience. Mm -hmm. If someone says they had this experience, you have to believe mm -hmm. them and say, wow, that's tragic. I am so sorry. Mm -hmm. I can say for myself, I did not see this happen. However, mm -hmm. If you know my history, I practiced with Patabi Joyce intensively in Mysore. Then I didn't see him for a whole chunk of yeah. years. Yeah. I wasn't in my, I didn't see the stuff going on. But I'm not saying it didn't happen. Mm -mm -mm. And anyone this happened to, it's horrible. It's a tragedy. He should never adjust like that. Is it possible to hold two conflicting ideas in yeah. our minds simultaneously? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what you can say, if it is, then you can acknowledge the bad things he did while also acknowledging none of us would have the opportunity to do this yoga if he hadn't taught it. Krishnamacharya beat people. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the yoga itself, the yoga is just the tool waiting to be wielded. If it's a hammer and I grab that hammer and beat my own thumb with it, I can't blame the hammer. If somebody hits me with the hammer, I don't blame the hammer. So the things that Patabi Joyce did and the, the things that he has allegedly done or done, I denounce that. No one should adjust like that. And then it starts going like, but it's, is it a reflection of Ashtanga? Mm -hmm. I don't know other teachers that adjust like that. I don't adjust like that. Manju doesn't adjust like that. Saraswati doesn't adjust like that. You don't adjust like that. I'm just saying, it's not a reflection of the system of yoga. And then it's, it's complicated because I know so many women that practiced and some women received the same adjustment and said it was fine. Mm. But you have to be sensitive to what people are feeling. But then I don't think it needs to be a reflection of Ashtanga. But if some people want to hate Ashtanga, it's okay. But the system I, of yoga works, and the man is dead. He is not here. And people say it was denied in, in the world of Ashtanga. I also, also don't see that. We had something called the confluence, where a lot of teachers got together and taught in, after Patabi Joyce yeah. passed away. And this, mm -hmm. when this subject came out, we spent a whole day, said, talk about it, let it out, express it. There was a whole panel of people, mostly women, discussing it, talking about it. It's important. Express it. Learn from it. Go on. I don't adjust like that. From the first day I ever did a teacher training, I talked about don't adjust like that. Mm -hmm. Why did he do it? You'd have to ask him, I don't know. I don't agree. Mm -hmm. But I also have to accept 
this yoga that I learned from him changed my life. And you also have, I mean, and have had very positive experiences with, with the Toby Joyce, right? I mean, Sorry? you had respect. You had very positive experiences with the yes. Toby Joyce. You had respect for him, and you know, you had a relationship, yeah. like an intimate and relationship. And so did David Williams, Nancy Gilgoff. Mm-hmm. I mean, you start reading. Mm-hmm. There's so, millions of people gain benefit from Ashtanga Yoga. Mm. So it's not the yoga, yeah. An inappropriate adjustment is inappropriate, regardless of who does it. And so I had a meeting with a very large yoga studio at one point, and they were talking about adjusting. I've had people say to me, David, do you think it's even appropriate to make hands-on adjustment now that all this stuff has been revealed? Mm. And I say, well, what are you going to do? Can you never get a, a massage again? Are you just going to go and lie on the, on the table and say, imagine I'm rubbing your shoulders, imagine I'm rub, rubbing your legs? Because somebody gave an inappropriate touch when giving a massage. Good adjustments are good. Bad adjustments are bad. Teach people how to make good adjustments. Mm. And then, so the the studio got together and they said, well, how are we going to deal with this? They came up with an idea, which is now kind of standard, I think. They came up with this idea that students should have a little card. Yes, yes. And they're going to place this card. I don't know what it looks like. Maybe it's a little, like, hands with a circle and a line through it or something. That means I don't want an adjustment. So you set this card near Matt. And their presentation to me, was they said, this will empower the students. I said, I disagree. That's not true. You are enabling the whole situation. Because what that card tells me is the teacher is too big and scary and way up here on this pedestal and you can't even say anything to them. So the best right. you can hope for is to set this card there and hope that this all-powerful being will respect mm. that little card. Mm. Empower the students to talk. Every class I teach, even in a Mysore class, I stand in front of the room and I say, okay, you guys, it's a Mysore class. If you want an adjustment, and I don't see you want that adjustment, you get my attention, I come adjust you. If I come adjust you, you don't want my help, you tell me to go away. Mm. Have a good practice. <laughs> and you'll say, yeah, but, but students are frightened to ask the teacher. I go, that's where the problem is. And you're not solving that problem by putting this card out there. Teachers have to be sincere and explain, please speak up. Then you solve yeah. the problem. Empower the student. All the power is in the teacher's hands. They're way up here. The teacher has to understand we are the servant of the student. We're like an asana waiter. Mat number seven needs more chasana di. <laughs> you go and help them. We are there to serve mm. the needs of the student. We're not there to lord over them, to be their master. The teacher is the servant. Switch that attitude in the teacher Mm. and also in the student's mind that they can speak. I don't believe those cards. When does the card ever go away? And how does that train them for life? Is yoga not a training for our existence out in the world? So how does that train them? Someone comes up and they're abusive to them in workplace or something. They just pull a little card out of their back pocket and wave it at the person in front of them because they haven't developed the ability to confront something right it should be taught in yoga as the ability to stand up and speak your mind that's my opinion <laughs> you'll always you give ask. it <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, look, we're it. running out of time but i want to obviously i have to ask a couple of questions that people love um how has your practice evolved what does your practice look like now and the other thing is um any tips on diet these are always the favorite questions <laughs> and not come from me. <laughs> I understand. Well, you know, our practice evolves every day. And sometimes this comes up like with the issue of like aging. But we tend to think of aging like I was 16, now I'm 63. But aging was yesterday was Sunday, today is Monday. Aging is I woke up at X time in the morning, now it's this time. Aging is happening every moment. So how do we deal with aging and our practice? You get on the mat 
and you start. You raise your arms. Take them and hail. Oh, boy, this is going to be rough today. Woo-hoo. Or you feel good. The reality is, yes, things change. And you just deal with it. You understand and you evolve with it in your practice. Focus more on your breath. Yeah. My practice doesn't look like it did before, but I don't care what my practice looks like. It wasn't hard to let go of it. Sure, it's hard to let go of. It's hard to accept that I don't have hair. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to accept a lot of things. But why does it, it's not going to help you to just fret about no. it all day long. Mm-hmm. You've got to start doing some comb over or getting plugs of hair <laughs> inserted in my scalp right. or, or something. You just accept it and go, huh, oh, well. And, and so it doesn't look the same, but it feels better. Meaning, when we're focused on how our practice looks, we get lost on this whole rabbit hole. Yeah. And I, I, I say that asanas are like money. They're like yoga currency, especially in the beginning when people are practicing. They're accumulating all these asanas like currency and putting it in their asana bank account. Yeah. Wow. I look at my bank ledger. Whoa. Primary series in there. I'm living large. Wow. But. Adam has second series. Second series neighborhood is probably better. The schools are better. The asanas are shinier and faster. And I need second. Ah, 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 legs behind the head. Inchamar <laughs> asana, hop around. Ooh, I got second. Okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe third. I think third is what I need. And we keep pushing, thinking mm. it's going to be in the next thing. If I could just catch my ankles in a back bend, that's it. But you know, you've been in my source. Somebody catches their ankles. They don't care. Now they're going to have you catch your shins and then your knees. And there's no end to it. So once you come to this realization, all asanas are the same. One is not more advanced nor less advanced than another. They each contain the potential for our growth. However, why have so many asanas then? Mm -hmm. They're like toys Mm -hmm. for a child. This is our laboratory. And at first, we need a lot of stuff because it keeps us focused. When you're doing something that's really difficult or even potentially dangerous, you've got to be really focused because you're on the edge. You don't but think they have any biological with... implications? Any, any biological implications for the nervous system? The, your more development in yoga means more intense kind of spinal work or, you know, stimulation of the nervous system, that kind of thing. Well, that kind of stuff, I'm mm-hmm. a little reluctant to, right. to say, because does that mean people with a flexible spine are the most well-adjusted, emotional, right. balanced mm-hmm. people? You know what I mean? It's the practice. It's Swadhyaya. It's studying how we react to the asanas we love, to the ones we hate, the whole journey. And then finding in the end that this yoga is medicine. And there are phases of your life that you want high doses of medication. You're fired up about it. You practice twice a day. Yeah, that's the medicine I wanted. I was Mm. thriving in it. Mm. Later, it's different. Yeah. Maybe you do 3A, 3B, the final three postures of closing. The expectation, the application is different. The yoga is the same, but how I approach it I don't care. I don't view one asana as more advanced than another. Do your practice in such a way that you practice and you feel good. Yeah? Practice in such a way that you have prana and energy in your body. Dietary things. I've learned that there are three topics it's almost better not even to talk about. Politics, religion, and dietary choices. Because people are very fired up about these three things. Mm. And most people already have a very strong opinion about one of those or all of those things. Mm. And any discussion is solely they're trying to convince you to think like them. It's not really some open-minded exchange of ideas. You know? However, I will say this about dietary choices. First of all, I don't tell people what they should or should not eat. I don't tell, you, tell people you got to be a vegetarian to do yoga mm-hmm. or whatever. I don't even go there. My parents weren't vegetarians. They were two of the most loving, kind, compassionate, open-hearted people I've ever known, not vegetarians. I know some vegetarians that are violent and narrow-minded. <laughs> However, 
when we start doing yoga, things change or things are already changing that make us want to do yoga. In some ways, it messes up our life. Things that used to be fun are not as fun anymore. Our friends go, let's go party. And we're like, uh, will it be smoky there? Um, what time will we be home? I have a yoga class in the morning. And even food we eat. You didn't want to, but you're reading labels on food products. How your body responds to certain foods you become more aware of. I think an, an internal awareness starts to happen without telling anybody to do something. Because you're down this rabbit hole of telling people what to eat. And there's always a more extreme view. Mm. Let people figure it out on their own. But as a general rule, the more processes that occur to a piece of food from the time it was harvested until it reaches your mouth, the less nutritional value there's going to be. Eat foods in their more whole state. Yeah. Mm. And I became a vegetarian when I was 13, which was very strange in Texas, you know. But again, I don't tell people they have to be a vegetarian because what kind of vegetarian? Are you a pescatarian? Are you a lacto-ovo vegetarian? Are you right. a vegan? Are you a, a, a Jain monk, you know, which is more extreme than a vegan? Are you a breatharian? Are you, a, you know, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Let people find their way. Respect people with a little difference of opinion than yours. Be healthy, be strong, and emanate some love. Because even people take things like diet as a way to feel superior to somebody else. I do this, you do that, and it's another way to do this fighting thing. Yeah. You know? I, I remember, maybe you're not doing it anymore, but I always remember you for the almonds. You, you said to, I think you told me years ago, I ate like eight or 15 almonds a day. I can't, I can't even remember why now, but whenever I see an almond, I always think of you. <laughs> I, I think it might almonds. just be a simple thing if I like almonds. <laughs> Was it that? But when I would travel, you know, sometimes I'm and you just want to have food. I would have yeah. nuts or right, seeds okay. and dried fruit and things just for some energy. Between classes, you can eat, right. eat a few nuts and have some. God, I, thought was, I thought there was a reason for it. All this time, I, I thought it was a magic was property in almonds. Reason. Yeah, I was, I was eating loads of almonds thinking maybe I could get those handstands like you did, you know? Yeah, well, I, I can yeah. maybe change the story and tell you. Yeah, you yeah, know, you right. eat eight time. almonds. Yeah. Yeah. Eight yeah. is a mystical number, and you have to chew them 68 yeah. times, each almond, and focus on the tip of your nose and hold your bandhas while you're doing it. You never know. <laughs> you never know. I just, uh, out on that point, just before we finish, um, is there any, I mean, people doing a lot of training outside practice now, um, specifying I need to do this kind of stretch or this extra training to get to this level. Um, it was a few years ago, we were told not uh, not to do anything apart from practice. What's your, you know, don't practice more than once a day, but there was the, the latter thing, the, the later kind of news, wasn't it? Uh, what do you think about that? Yoga should be a tool for your life. Mm. Do the th do yoga so that you can enjoy the other things to an even higher degree in your life. I've had people say, David, I'm a runner. Should I stop running if I do yoga? I say, do you like running? Yeah, it makes me feel so great. So keep running. Your running will not help your yoga, but your yoga will help your running. Mm. Do the things you love in life. But you don't have to do a bunch of other stuff to warm up and prepare for your yoga. That's like, if the I want to become enough. better... Well, it, it's enough for the yoga practice, but if you want to go swimming or hiking or jogging or running or ride your bicycle or do, you know, be active, people started thinking the goal is to become like robo yogi, like an asana machine. You know, you drop the coins in and you do your asanas and then you just sit in a little cotton box the rest of the day. The goal of the yoga is to enhance your other experiences, you know? And so people would conserve all of their energy just to do an asana. But I say this, you know, in a joking manner, there's a difference between doing yoga or just making an asana of ourselves. Mm. It's not just about making shapes. The asanas are tools for the rest of, of the things that you do. And so rather than think of, like, I know people go, I need to do some warm ups before Surya Namaskar, before my practice. And I go, yeah, but Surya Namaskar A is the warm up. 
first two or three, just walk back and forth. A prepares you for B. B prepares you for standing, standing for seated, et cetera. It's built right in there. Otherwise, when does it stop? I have to do a warm-up for my warm-up. I need to do a preparation for the preparation of the thing I'm preparing to do for the preparation. It just goes on and on and on. Right. So you never went away and did like thousands of press-ups a day or thousands in the bar. That's right. And and there's there's a, a point where the the goal is not to spend longer and longer on the mm. mat. The goal is to spend less and less time on the mat. Yeah. Spend more time with your family. Go out there, mm. write a novel. Go out there, get involved in politics and be a healthy, strong voice out there in the world of madness. You know, Take your yoga into other arenas rather than just thinking like, how am I going to do Bhada Konasana? <laughs> right? Finally, what... Um... What's your inspiration? Well, one inspiration and one um, kind of indulgence, guilty pleasure. My inspiration in life or? Yeah, one inspiration, a book, a person, a place, anything. Well, anything I'm inspired by my wife, Shelley, that mm-hmm. if you've ever met Shelley, you understand. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's an inspiring, uh, bright light. I'm inspired, was inspired by my parents. I'm inspired by nature. I'm inspired by, yeah, beauty in the form of innocence and animals and and things like that. I'm inspired by people that do heroic acts. Right now, it's even like, um, hey, a medical personnel during this COVID thing. I'm inspired by how they commit themselves in these dangerous environments to helping others. Yeah, I'm inspired by people that that exhibit incredible qualities of valor and humility in ways that I think I never could, but I'm inspired and hope to emulate what I see from them. Guilty pleasures. Anything I do, I've trained myself to not feel guilty about it. (laughs) (laughs) Don't feel guilty about stuff you want to do. What's the point? (laughs) If you're going to do it, don't feel guilty about it. Feel good about it. You know, whatever it is. I mean, I don't, do horrible things that I, you know, I don't think I do, but you know, yeah, you he trains yourself to be a psychopath. Yeah. Eat the chocolate cake and feel good. Enjoy the chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> don't feel guilty. If you're going to feel guilty, don't do it. <laughs> then you got to carry that burden, <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today, David. And thanks for taking the time. Um, Adam, yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Give our love to Teresa. Mm-hmm.